Hi, I'm Dr. Marissa Caudill, your friendly neighborhood child psychiatrist. It's great to see you. Today I'm going to be talking with you about SSRI medications. And essentially this video is meant to be a supplement to the informed consent process that I typically do in my office when starting new patients on these medications. So let's dive in. SSRI is an acronym that stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. And these are prescription medications that your physician may consider to treat depression or anxiety disorders, such as generalized anxiety, panic disorder, OCD, or social anxiety. These generally are very well tolerated and effective medications, though they don't work for everyone. And there has been some press discussing their use being maybe not effective at all better than placebo. I think they probably are turned to too quickly in many cases, but at the same time, I know that for some people, they can really be life-saving and life-changing medications. So I don't mean for this to be a replacement for a conversation that you would have with your own doctor, nor does this video constitute me establishing a treatment relationship with anyone watching it. I merely mean this to be educational and to provide answers and um, conversation starters for you and your own prescriber. So let's consider the three medications that are used most often in kids. And these are Prozac, which is fluoxetine, Celexa, which is citalopram, and Zoloft, which is sertraline. So I'm gonna talk about those one by one later, but first I wanna kind of discuss the things that I usually discuss with my patients, namely, what are these medications for? What are the common side effects? And how do you manage those side effects? what's sort of the worst case scenario with these medications and a discussion of the black box warning that the Food and Drug Administration has placed on these medications. We talk about um, how long it's going to take to see a good response from the medication, how long is the trial going to be, and then if the medication works for you, how long will your child end up taking it for. So let's go one by one through those. In terms of what are these medications for? We discussed that already, right? They're used to treat clinical depression and anxiety disorders. And in terms of the side effects, the most common side effects that these medications as a class tend to have are effects on levels of alertness. So you might be more tired, more sedated, want to take a nap. Usually I tell my patients, it's not going to feel like you can't make it through your day, but a very common scenario is that people tell me, if I'm just like laying around on a usual day, I'm way more likely to take a nap than I ever was before. Um, these also can cause changes in sleep patterns where you either might sleep more than usual at night or you may have insomnia and sleep less than usual. And if they are activating, they can make you feel more restless or even more anxious. And again, that's usually just in the first few weeks. The good news about side effects is that for most people, they do get better and go away eventually after a couple of weeks on the medication. And the other good news is that we usually can minimize them if they do start to have, uh, you know, if you notice side effects that are a problem for you, talking to your doctor and reducing the dose of the drug that you start on or the frequency can also be effective. These medications you should know are also available in liquid form. Your doctor may not know that or may not offer that to you, but if you feel that the starting dose is too much, you can get it at the beginning in a liquid form that allows you to have more control over what dose you begin at and to increase it more slowly to make it more tolerable for you. In terms of managing those side effects, um, when it comes to being more awake or more sleepy, like I said, I usually adjust the dose or the timing. So if a person is feeling more awake, we usually do it in the morning. If it's causing insomnia when they take it at night, you switch it to trying in the morning. And likewise, if it's causing you to feel too sleepy taking it in the morning, you would switch to taking it with your dinner. Usually these medications also can cause upset stomach to some degree. There are neurons all throughout your gut as well, and these medications increase serotonin signaling, which increases motility. So that tends to present as either queasiness or frank nausea or vomiting or upset stomach. Again, it's not everybody who has this, but it's a pretty common side effect. You can also experience constipation with some of these medications that tends to be more anticholinergic. Again, GI side effects tend to be short-lived within the first few weeks. This should normalize and can usually be managed. So taking the medication with food can help. Using ginger root capsules three times a day with meals can help with upset stomach, nausea, and queasiness. 
an anti-diarrheal medication if necessary, um, or you know, adding things like bananas can help if you're having loose stools. Again, the good news is that usually gets better. And if you have any severe upset stomach symptoms, you should talk to your doctor about it to manage it because obviously nausea is a really difficult thing to live with. In terms of other side effects, you can read the whole list of potential side effects, though if you're someone who tends to worry about these things, I recommend that you don't. Just keep in mind that common things are common. So when you look at any drug in the side effect profiles, things like headaches, runny nose, cold symptoms, those things are almost reported universally among medications, and that's because those things are just things that happen. Um, but that said, there is potentially an increased risk of headaches. So if you're someone who's prone to headaches, you may want to kind of keep a headache journal and see if your headaches seem more frequent or more severe after starting a medication like this. Um, and there's an exception to every rule too. Sometimes these medications can be really helpful for people who have chronic headaches, even migraines. So it's not that everyone's headaches are going to get worse. Sometimes they get better. Other things that can occur are bruxism, which is jaw clenching or teeth grinding, um, urinary retention, again, these things are more rare, and sexual side effects are probably more common than we give them credit for, and I think it's under-investigated when we're prescribing these to kids. I mean, obviously for young kids, it's not such a concern, but for teenagers, changes in their sexual functioning may be very concerning, and I think it's something that we could probably do a better job as child psychiatrists in discussing with our teenage patients. And as a parent, it may be uncomfortable to have that conversation with your kids, but if you open the door, they might talk to you about it if they have concerns. The good news, again, about sexual side effects is that they are usually short-lived and tend to get better on the medication over time. And if they don't, when you stop the medication, sexual functioning generally returns to its prior baseline. It's not a permanent negative effect on one's sexual functioning, but it basically can reduce libido and interest in sex or ability to achieve orgasm or delayed ejaculation for men. So those are things that we should discuss with our patients as well and patients should be aware of. So how long does it take to see a response if you decide to try one of these medications? How long is it gonna take before you feel better? And usually it's gonna take a few weeks. A trial of these medications is generally six to eight weeks. For Prozac, which has a long half-life, it can take longer because it takes longer for the drug to reach a steady state in your system. Whereas a medication like Zoloft that has a shorter half-life is going to reach steady state sooner and therefore hypothetically could re result in improvements sooner. Generally, if a person's going to respond to these medications within the first month, they typically see some positive changes. That's not always the case. There are some outliers, people who will only respond out at the 8 to 12 week point. But most of us as psychiatrists will say that if we haven't seen a response in the first four to six weeks, we're probably not going to. And in clinical trials, a trial of these medications is considered six weeks of taking the medication every day as prescribed. So if you do that and you don't have a good positive outcome, then your doctor's probably gonna recommend trying a second drug. Um, I think a lot of times in psychiatry, people feel that it is, they feel like a guinea pig. And that is because our science is really sort of trial and error. We don't have a way to know which drug is gonna work best for which person. And honestly, we don't understand it because these medications in a Petri dish all seem to do the same thing. But for individuals, they might respond great to Prozac and they might have tried Lexapro and Zoloft and done 12 weeks of trials and had no significant improvement. So what I want you to know is that if you don't respond to the first medication you try, you should not give up hope. You should have hope that you and your doctor together working will be able to find a medication that works for you. More commonly, what we see is sort of a partial response where some things get better, but maybe there's some side effects. And then you're left wondering, should I switch and try something else that might be better, but it also might be worse? And I think that's a decision that only you can make. Only you, the person who's being prescribed these medications, can know if the improvement you've seen in your mood or your anxiety level is worth whatever side effect you're experiencing. But it's worth a conversation with your doctor if you are having persisting side effects to see if there's other things you can do that might help manage those. In terms of how long you're gonna stay on a medication, assuming you have a positive response and you're doing better, usually from that point, I recommend that my patients stay on the medication for at least 12 months. And then we slowly will taper them off of it if they want to come off of it. Typically for students in school, for example, say you're a teenager and you're dealing with depression and it's led to significant decline in your grades and your functioning. 
I will recommend staying on that until the end of some school year, at least 12 months in the future, and then spending that summer slowly coming off the medication so that if any symptoms do come back, we could potentially put you back on the medication before starting the next school year and recover your functioning. Typically, people are able to come off of these medications, and I want everyone to know as well, therapy is a very important part of your treatment, so I never recommend medication alone to treat depression or anxiety disorders without therapy. You should be in concurrent therapy, um, ideally on at least a weekly basis for the time that you're taking these medications so that you can learn the skills to help yourself manage the symptoms that you've been dealing with that led you to seek a medication in the first place. So let's talk about the black box warning that's on these medications. I think this is the thing that parents are most fearful of. The Food and Drug Administration placed a black box warning on SSRIs in 2004. And this is because there's an increased risk in suicidal thoughts and behaviors for kids who are taking medications like SSRIs versus kids in the treatment trials who took placebo pills. And you know the general incidence is about double the risk, but that's still less than 5% of people who take these medications. In my clinical experience, a child who already has suicidal thoughts is the one who I'm most worried about developing worsening of suicidal thoughts or more intense suicidal thoughts or behaviors such as cutting. But with all of my patients starting these medications, we talk about the possibility that that could occur. If it did occur, how would the child deal with it? Who would they turn to? We come up with a plan of who are they gonna call? How is the family gonna reach me? Where would they go if they needed emergency care? And then we talk about safety in the home. So for kids who might be self-injuring or who have done that in the past, I encourage parents and kids to go through their room and their bathroom together and remove any sharps that they might use to cut. And for families that live together, I make sure that they go through their, their medicine cabinets and look for any medications like Tylenol, aspirin, cold medications, and pain medications, and keep all of those things under lock and key somewhere. Parents can buy a medication lockbox or a cheap plastic toolbox and put a padlock on it, and then just keep those medications away from a child. Again, we're talking about risk reduction. So when teenagers and kids feel hopeless and suicidal, they often turn to the first thing available and they're not thinking very clearly in that moment. So anything we can do to remove access to things that could be dangerous, I recommend you do. It's better to be safe than sorry. I also ask all families whether they have firearms and I ask all kids whether they have access to firearms in other people's homes. And I make sure that those family members and friends who might have firearms have locked them up, keeping them out of reach of kids and any ammunition is not stored with the weapon. So that's my general spiel about side effects, how to manage the side effects. I think we talked about that. Yeah, we talked about ginger root, changing the timing of the medication if there's sedation or alertness, um, or reducing the dose with liquid forms. We talked about the black box warning. We talked about how long to see a response, and we talked about how long are you gonna be on these medications. That usually answers like 90% of people's questions. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for you. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit specifically about the three medications that I use most often, first, second, and third line when I'm prescribing SSRIs to young people. And those medications are Prozac, which is fluoxetine, Zoloft, which is sertraline, and Celexa, which is citalopram. Let's go through them one by one. So Prozac or fluoxetine is a once a day medication, typically dosed first thing in the morning because it's most likely to cause you to feel more energized or more alert. I usually start with 10 milligrams a day, and then if someone has difficulty or side effects, we'll go to 10 milligrams every other day. The starting dose is for the first two weeks because it takes two weeks to reach a steady state blood level with this medication. So if you started at 10 milligrams a day, after two weeks, we would get you to 20 milligrams a day. The goal is to get to 20 milligrams a day and to stay on that for at least six weeks because that's a usual effective dose for most people and six weeks is a trial duration. If you're having severe side effects and you can't tolerate the medication, obviously you need to stop the medicine and talk to your doctor about alternatives or how you're gonna manage that. In terms of overall dosing of Prozac, depending on what you're treating and depending on your own biology, your doctor may end up pushing the dose pretty high. Some people metabolize Prozac very quickly, and so they might need upwards of 100 milligrams or more per day, but most people are going to respond to doses of 20 to 40 milligrams a day. The pills come in 10, 20, and 40 milligram doses and are available generically. 
Let's talk next about Celexa. Celexa or citalopram is another SSRI that I would typically prescribe for a person who's very anxious, stressed, high strung, having trouble sleeping, can't relax. And I would recommend this medication over Prozac for such a person because it tends to be more calming and more sedating. For that reason, I usually recommend that it be dosed at night with dinner. And again, like Prozac, the usual starting dose for Celexa is 10 milligrams a day. We might increase after two weeks to 20 milligrams a day, which is the usual lowest effective dose, and give that six weeks to work. Um, actually, with Celexa, you could increase from 10 to 20 faster. You could do it after five to seven days because it has a shorter half-life, so your body will reach a steady state more quickly. Celexa and its cousin molecule, Lexapro, are essentially the same active drug. Celexa, so when it is manufactured, is like a racemic mixture, which means it's two mirror image molecules like your right and left hands. Only the left hand molecule is the active one, and that has been marketed separately as Lexpro or s citalopram So if you were to start at 10 milligrams of Celexa, that essentially has half of that milligram dose in the active form, which is five milligrams of Lexapro. So typically people start with five milligrams of Lexapro and then increase to 10 milligrams and end up on a maximum dose of 20 milligrams. The maximum dose of Celexa is 40 milligrams, and that's because there's some potential at higher doses for cardiac conduction problems. It's not necessary to get an EKG before or after starting Celexa in a healthy person, but if an individual has a history of any kind of cardiac problems or irregular heartbeat or arrhythmias, then you would wanna make this conversation one with your cardiologist and have pre and post EKG data to make sure that everything looks okay. The last drug that's a great drug but has some limitations, which I'll discuss next, is sertraline. So sertraline or Zoloft is a wonderful medication in adults, it seems to be probably the most effective SSRI by a little margin. In kids, though, there's a big caveat, and that's that young people tend to metabolize Zoloft faster than adults. And so more often than not, because of its short half-life, they feel better and do better if you take it twice a day. This is a huge downside in my mind, because for kids to remember to take a pill in the morning and another one 12 hours later, for them and their parents, it's a really difficult thing. So for this reason, I usually don't use Zoloft first line. I usually use it if Prozac or Celexa or both have failed. Um, but for older teenagers and young adults, Zoloft might be a very good place to start because again, older teenagers and young adults are more likely to do fine taking Zoloft once a day. Unlike Prozac and Celexa, for most people, Zoloft is not too activating or sedating. So I tell people they should take this at the same time every day whenever it's gonna be most convenient for them to do so. The starting dose is usually 25 milligrams, and you would have your dose increase after five to seven days to 50 milligrams a day, which is the lowest usual effective dose, and then give it six weeks to see if it's gonna be helpful for you. People usually end up on a dose of between 50 and 200 milligrams a day, though for some disorders like OCD, your doctor may push the dose up to 250 or 300 milligrams if it seems helpful for you. All right, so that pretty much sums up how I usually talk to my patients to get informed consent for prescriptions of SSRI medications. And I hope that's helpful to you as a parent or a child considering these medications or as a provider to share this video with your patients. Because often I know we have these discussions with our patients and then they go home and they think of other questions and it can be helpful to have a resource like this to refer back to, especially for a parent who may not have been able to make it to the original appointment to discuss all these details when you're considering a prescription like an SSRI. I also would point you towards my website, which is www.theparentdoctor.com and the website for the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. The link to that is also present on my website. I'll be posting this video along with a PDF summary of the topics we discussed on my website, and that's a free download for anyone who's interested. So thanks for listening. Please share this with anyone you think could benefit from it, and I hope to see you soon here. Take care.